And then there's the pelvis. And there's the pelvis of Homo viloresiensis compared to that of Africanus and Agaster. Uh, no pelvis are known for Homo habilis, so here we can't compare it directly. No pelvis are known also for Homo erectus, but uh, for one reason or another we think it's not likely to have been much different than that of Homo ergaster. And now is the time to introduce Bill Youngers, whom I've mentioned before, who sometimes pronounces his name Youngers and sometimes Jungers. Um, and he is at Stony Brook University, which is officially the State University of New York. He's a functional and comparative anatomist, studied lots of human fossils, and here he is uh, showing his latest acquisition. And he said, although previous publications, or he was attributed to say, although previous publications have described the pelvis as similar to those of the much more primitive Australopithecines, Young has found that the orientation of the pelvic blades is modern. So it's not as, as Australopithecine-like as it formerly been thought. Here are the femora, and you can see Floresiensis there, differs from all of these. It's not like any of them. It's perhaps between Australopithecus africanus and, and Homo, but it's very thick for its length. So short, thick, robust, female. All the lymph nodes are very robust. And when you look at the limb proportions, um, the graph shows um, the length of the radius, the forearm, against the length of the femur. Um, so essentially it's an arm to leg length thing. And you can see gorillas and chimps surrounded by a blue oval have expectedly um, short legs compared to their arms. And humans, both Homo sapiens and Homo ergaster, surrounded by the red oval, have expectedly long legs and short arms. You all knew that anyway. But here's some of the fossils. Um, there is uh, Lucy there, the, the triangle. And uh, unfortunately, because all the, the femora of Homo habilis are incomplete, um, there are different models of its relative length. And uh, it might actually fall just within the modern human range, arm to leg length, or it might be more like Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis. So those are the various estimates, but um, it's quite clear that LV1 falls well outside the human range, also outside the ape range, and it is quite <coughs> like Lucy, and possibly like Homo habilis as well. So what can you say about the postcranial skeleton of Homo floresiensis? Short thick bones, long arms, short legs, and here's Bill again. He said in his talk that there will be one includes an essentially complete foot, something not identified previously, and hinted that the foot is extremely large. So these hobbits may or may not have hairy feet, but they sure have big feet. Indonesia's hobbits, like Tolkien's fictional creatures, may have tracked about on big hairy feet. But the size of the feet is something extraordinary that uh, Young goes, goes on about. And um, when you look at the humerus, the upper arm bone, um, Susan Larson uh, has made um, some comments on it. She concluded that the upper arm and shoulder were oriented slightly differently in Homo floresiensis than in living people. The shoulder blade was shrugged slightly forward, changing its articulation of the humerus and allowing the small humans to bend their elbows and work with their hands as we do. This slightly hunched posture, she says, would not have hampered the little people except when it came to making long overhand throws. They would have been bad baseball pitchers, says Larson. Larson is American. <laughs> Homo Agasta also has a relatively untwisted humerus, a feature not previously noted. So when you look at the orientation of the head of the humerus on the neck, that's how it is in us. That's how it is in Homo floresiensis, the hobbit, you see? The, um, the, the femur is less twisted round on the, um, on, the, on the head, on its shoulder joint. And what she noticed, which people hadn't noticed before, perhaps because the humerus of Homo ergaster is incomplete, but you can tell that the orientation of the head is different from modern humans, and is like that of Homo floresiensis. So she says that um, the evolution of the modern shoulder was a two-stage process, and Homo ergaster and Homo floresiensis was the first step. 
So what we're getting is a picture that Homo floresiensis most resembles creatures that live, say, around the two to two and a half million year ago mark. So it's uh, when you compare it to things, what you compare it to is Homo agaster, Homo habilis, marginally perhaps, just marginally the last of the seeds. It's unlike Homo sapiens and all these things, but at the same time, Homo floresiensis has its own distinctive features. One of these we've already met, the robusticity of the long bones. The scan of LB1's brain. First of all, there's its, there's its size, so the top left, and you can see it's tiny, tiny, tiny. It's osteopithecine sized, no doubt about it, it's smaller than Homo erectus or Homo sapiens. And here is the work of Dean Falk. Um, and she studied um, the uh, endocast, or at least a, a scan, an internal scan, of um, LV1, the hobbit. And there it is in the middle in both these pictures, compared to Homo sapiens at the top, Homo erectus on the right, a chimpanzee at the bottom, completely safe, and a microcephalax brain scan on the left. And you can see that it's very unlike the microcephalic. It is most like Homo erectus. It's, in fact, has no resemblance to the modern microcephalic, which just looks weird. And uh, she compared it to Homo erectus, but uh, agrees that, uh, um, for completeness' sake, uh, Homo uh, habilis and, and that sort of thing would probably be the next thing to compare it. So is it directly descended from something like Homo habilis? It seems to resemble Homo habilis more than any other, but we don't know the postcranial skeleton of Homo erectus. We have to assume it's like Homo ergaster, and as you can see, it's not unlike. Nothing else is quite so tiny, so actually we don't know what a dwarfed Homo erectus would look like, but it doesn't look to me like if you extrapolate Homo erectus downward, that's what you get. Oh, the subadult from Damanisi resembles Homo habilis, and um, we've seen, though, that it is rather different from the, the true adult. But a process called pedomorphosis, that is, when the adult of the descendant looks like the young of the ancestor, is also quite a possibility. Then came the skeptics. No, no, skeptics with a C, not skeptics with a K. True skeptics with a K take the evidence at hand. But uh, the deniers, as we we'll call them, came in and said, no, it's a modern human. And there are three major papers that were published. First, we have a paper by Yakov and his colleagues. Pigmoid Australomedonesian Homo sapiens skeletal remains from the Agua Flores. Well, they make it clear. They think that it's a pathological individual. And I must say, two of the co-authors of this paper uh, Thorne and Henneberg um, published this uh, on the web and in the, uh, in the newspapers almost as soon as uh, Homo floresiensis was described. And um, uh, they evidently had a bit of a hard time getting it into the peer reviewed literature and finally they got it into the, the journal, um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where rather than a peer review, you get a member of the academy to present it for publication. Then we get a paper by Martin et al. Flores hominid new species or microcephalic dwarf, question mark, which comes to much the same conclusions as Jacob et al., but I think it's a more sophisticated paper, as we'll see. And finally, we get a paper by Gary Richards, genetic, physiologic, and eco-geographic factors contributing, etc., etc. So there they are. Hobbit denial. 